Welcome to Leaders Recon, where we'll be discussing leadership, warrior skills, and other unique opportunities within the G3 leader development branch. Today, we'll be discussing great power competition and strategic planning with Colonel Jingaleski. Colonel Jingaleski, welcome to the program. Thanks, happy to be here. So for those in our audience who don't know that much about your past experience, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a, uh, <clears throat> I'm a Virginia Guardsman, I'm an armor officer, uh, I was commissioned in 1996 as an armor officer, served in the California Guard, West Virginia Guard, and Virginia Guard. Been a uh, Title 10 AGR since 2000, uh, so I've been in the program for quite a while. Uh, <clears throat> started off as a functional area 50 force manager, did that for about six years, and then uh, went into the training division, was a training strategist, kind of like the strategy world. Um, applied to, for the School of Advanced Military Studies in 2008. When I was at Command and General Staff College, was accepted, and then uh, graduated from there <clears throat> in 2009, and have been a planner uh, ever since. So it's been a rewarding career. It's been not your normal National Guard career, but I think that's part of the beauty of being the National Guard uh, compared to the regular Army is that it's not as lockstep and and career paths. So what was it that initially made you want to join the military? I'd love to tell you that it was kind of God and country, but um, what happened was is that my father was laid off of work uh, when I was in college, and uh, a friend of mine who I played basketball with in college uh, on, the, on our college team was in ROTC, and he said, hey, you know, why don't you think about going into ROTC? You know, there's scholarships available, and he um, said, yeah, sure, why not? So, you know, I uh, talked with my dad, and every um, – generation of my family has, has served in the military since we, we came over from Eastern Europe in the early 1900s. So just kind of kind of worked its way out. And, you know, I got a scholarship uh, and the Army's had an officer for 24 years now. So looking at strategic planning as we're kind of diving into this, you know, when I hear the term strategy or strategist or strategic planning, like it sounds interesting. Um, but like actually putting my finger on what that is, can you kind of dive into like what does a strategic planner do within DOD? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think um, at a very fundamental level, we bring order out of chaos. You know, we're, we're, we're usually at higher level of commands, usually at the two to four star level of command, and everything's very ambiguous. So as a, as a strategist or a planner, you have to develop strategies and plans that provide order um, to the operational environment around us. So there's really two kinds of planning. There's institutional planning, which is what the services do in terms of how do we build a budget? How do we modernize? How do we build weapon systems? How do we develop doctrine? And then you have operational planning, which is really done at the combatant command and army service component command level, which is, okay, the, <clears throat> the army has built an army. So how do I utilize it operationally in a certain part of the world for a certain mission? So that, that, that's, that's what we do. You know, we build plans, we develop strategies whether it's institutionally or operationally, depends on your assignment. But uh, what we look for um, in our career field is to to have kind of a career path where you veer in and out of both worlds. So by the time you, you reach the colonel rank, you're familiar with both. You kind of talked about the different levels there a little bit. Can you dive into like, at what point in a career should someone, if they're interested in, in getting involved with that, should they start looking into things? And then like, you know, what's the best method sure. to go about doing that? So I would recommend, you know, Probably um, because it's 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 a it's an officer only career path, right? Unfortunately, there aren't paths for warrant officers or enlisted to become a strategist. Um, what I would look at is probably post company command to start thinking about it, because you're right on the cusp of getting promoted to major. The field grade level is where you start getting into the ambiguous environments. When you're a company commander, you know, you're always nested within a battalion, which is nested within a brigade, which is nested within a division. So if you want to become a functional area 59 strategist or an operational planner or a SAMS grad, it's a much different level of thinking. You know, you're out of the tactical world, you know, the application of, of fire and maneuver. Um, you still have to know that, it's still very important to know that, but it's just a different le level of thinking. So I think probably the senior captain, early major, uh, in, the, in the early part of your, your career as a major, start looking at um, whether you want to stay within your, your basic branch, and that's what SAMS allows you to do. So I'm still, a, still an armor officer, but if you want to go into a career field, uh, that's where 
you, you, you leave your operational field, uh, your basic branch, and you get a functional area, and that's how you become a, a functional area 59. Do you think that your experience then as an armor officer, I mean, I'm guessing you were an armor company commander. Yep. Um, how did that play a role into when you went on to SAMS and later on? Well, SAMS is, is almost strictly focused on operational level planning. So what does that mean? <clears throat> Traditionally, that's been, you know, your theater army and your core level um, where you're taking strategies and you're trying to operationalize it so the tactical units can execute it, mm -hmm. okay? So if you don't have an understanding of tactics at the battalion and brigade level, you can't really build an operational plan for a division or for a corps, mm -hmm. right? So I was an infantry division G5, boom, uh, 29th Infantry Division out of Virginia. We went to okay. Afghanistan. So you have to understand the tactical being the lowest level, but you also have to understand the strategic and you have to understand how they mesh. And that's your job as, a, as an operational planner is to develop those operational plans that consist of the tactical execution and the strategic policy and goals. Kind of talk about the guard specifically. Mm -hmm. um, what are the opportunities for you know, strategists or people looking at that career field, both mm -hmm. on the Title 10 side, but is there on the Title 32 side as well? Yeah, there is. Each uh, state joint force headquarters has a 59 uh, position. I think it's a lieutenant colonel billet in their J5. And then um, the, the division headquarters, so the uh, Army National Guard division headquarters, they have I believe five SAMS grads uh, and one strategist billet. So if you're in a state that has a division headquarters, uh, you can you can certainly go that route. Uh, in terms of the Title 10 program, we have a much greater requirement for strategists between the Army Guard staff, the National Guard Joint Staff, and then really across the Title 10 AGR program, whether it's on the Headquarters Department of the Army staff, the big joint staff, Secretary of Defense's staff, or even, you know, the combatant commands. We have 59 CUDA positions there. SAMS, um, a little bit different. Uh, one of our issues in the Guard right now is that we just don't have the throughput through both schoolhouses. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we're kind of inter interchangeable. You know, so the, the active army is a little bit different. Um, you know, they, they look at utilizing their strategists a little bit differently than their SAMS grads. But because we're, we're the Guard and we just don't have the, the mass of personnel that have either one of the, the schooling requirements or the educational requirements, we kind of get treated the same way. What would you say from your experience so far has been like the most rewarding um, or unique experience that you've had working as a strategist or a planner? <sighs> That's a tough question. Um, <clears throat> there's probably been two. Um, the, the first one was, I was the lead planner for the first drawdown in Afghanistan in 2011. Um, at the core level. And basically what happened was is <clears throat> General Petraeus was the, the ISAF commander and he said, look, the core has 75,000 personnel under it. The core has to develop the plan and then everybody else will just fall in around it. Well, I guess some general officer liked me and said, hey, I want you to, to do this job. And, and that was very rewarding. It was very frustrating because we didn't get much guidance because the, the president, um, he was the determiner. I mean, he literally went up to West Point and had a press conference and said, here are your conditions. You're going to reduce by 10,000 and by December of 2011. And then the, the next 20,000 are going to be in 2012. So that, that was that was frustrating, but it was interesting because um, you're, you're almost you're kind of part of history, right? You're, you're, you're doing something that's that's going to be remembered in the historical record, which is just fascinating. And then the second um the second job I had, which was fascinating, was working in the War Plans Division and then the J-5 and the big joint staff. Mm -hmm. And I was the PACOM and TRANSCOM planner there for two years, and then I was the Global Posture Branch Chief. And what was fascinating, fascinating about that job was just the exposure you get. <clears throat> I had to brief the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Dunford, a number of times. Uh, I briefed Congress five times. Uh, where I had to go over to the Rayburn building and, and talk with congressional staff members. And then uh, I actually had to build two briefs for two different presidents. So I didn't brief the presidents. There were general officers doing that, but I was the one building the brief. So that was that was pretty fascinating as well. So just, just those two assignments, you wouldn't think, you know, somebody from the National Guard would be offered those opportunities. Well, I'm telling you, it happens. And it happened to me, and it can happen to anybody else who comes in this career field. So it's, um, 
it's fascinating. It really is. It's like I never expected to, to have a career like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, the opportunities that have been given to me have been just flat out amazing. So kind of shifting gears a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. touching you touched on some of those unique experiences you were in. As we're shifting the focus here and talking about multi-domain operations mm -hmm. and, and uh, this kind of competition phase sure. with, uh, I guess, China specifically, we know the national defense strategy kind of focuses on that great power competition. What does that look like today? Well, like everything, it depends. I think from an army perspective, a lot of the multi-domain operations doctrine is really rooted in air land battle, which was developed in the eighties, the deep battle aspect of using deep fires, deep aviation attacks. The difference today is you have cyber, you have electronic warfare to a much greater extent than we had in the past, and then you have space. So if you add those three capabilities into the mix, it makes it more complicated, more complex, more difficult because of our reliance on digital communication systems, you know, to, to pass along digital graphics, mm -hmm. or just for simple voice communications. What happens when, you know, you have an electronic warfare attack uh, on your unit and it burns your communication system out and now you can't communicate. It, it, it really is a, a challenging uh, environment. <clears throat> and the Russians specifically have invested a great deal of money. They always have in electronic warfare, but now they're, they're doing it um, to, to an even greater extent. So what they've done in the Ukraine and, and uh, Crimea, you know, shutting down communications and then using special forces and precision guided munitions with their artillery and aircraft is really a, um, really a bit of a change mm -hmm. um, from what we've been used to. Because look, the last 20 years, what have we been focused on? We've been focused on you know, counterinsurgencies, um, non-state actors where you don't have to worry about large scale units. You don't have to worry about you know, net, you know, the Al-Qaeda tank division, right? You're worried about two or three guys with an RPG or an IED detonating. It's a very tactical fight. And that's the difference I think <clears throat> that we have to progress to is we're really going, you know, in a way back to the future where we're getting back to the focus is going to go back to brigade, division, core level operations. And those are skills that have atrophied in the army because we simply haven't had the requirement to do them because our focus has been elsewhere. Kind of touching on that, what do you see then as, from your perspective, as like one of the greater emerging threats in the world today? And, uh, and as a second part to that, and you know, we're doing, we're recording this during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, has the pandemic uh, changed that uh, dynamic at all? I went through a little bit of an uncle ball here. I think the greatest, um, the greatest threat to our nation right now is our national debt. And I don't say that because, um, I don't say that lightly, number one, and it's not a new idea. I've heard when I was on the Joint Staff, General Dempsey had said that, and General Dunford had said that. And so while COVID uh, has made that even more problematic is that, you know, we've spent four and a half, five trillion dollars over the last two months during this pandemic. There's a result of that, which is that the national debt is going to increase. And so, well, what does that have to do with the, the military, you may have to ask? Well, DOD has the largest discretionary budget within our nation. So if anything gets cut to pay for all this money that we borrowed, DOD is the most likely source of where you're gonna see cuts. So <clears throat> from that perspective, national debt is your, is your number one problem because at a certain point in time, your interest payments are going to eclipse, and that time is very close by the way, your interest payment, payments are going to eclipse your entire DOD budget, okay? So, <clears throat> When you get into a an adversarial approach, who are our adversaries and who we need to be focused on? Obviously, China. Um, China has been expansionist for the last ten to fifteen years. Uh, they've created uh, artificial islands in the South China Sea and militarized them, putting air aircraft on them, airfields on them, air defense assets. They now have carriers, and they're looking to build a full blue water navy. And they have a the Silk Road Initiative, which is basically expanding their reach economically. And, and the thing about the Chinese is they expand economically and then they follow militarily. So South Sudan, they get 50,000 barrels of oil a day out of South Sudan. Now they have two battalions worth of Chinese peacekeepers in South Sudan. 
Uh, so it's very interesting from that perspective of what the Chinese are looking to do because if they have 1.3 billion people, they have to ensure that resources, whether it's food, oil, natural gas, what have you, it has to flow back into China mm -hmm. because if it doesn't, then you got a real problem. And the problem with it is the Chinese are a very orderly society uh, based on Confucianism. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the most important thing is to have order in their society. And if their people aren't happy because they don't have access to food, you know, heat, potable water, that sort of thing, then you have a real problem. I think what you're going to see is this continual tension and friction between the United States and China all over the world for a number of different reasons. And the whole COVID-19 crisis hasn't helped because it came out of China. Don't know how it came out of China, whether it was at a wet market or somewhere else. Don't know, but it's, um, it certainly hasn't helped matters and have, it hasn't helped relations between the two countries. One of the strategic um, displays of power, because that's what you're really talking about, is the Navy, they, they call it freedom of navigation operations. So they'll take a carrier task force and they'll run it through China, between China and Taiwan and the Taiwan Straits. Um, the Air Force likes to take bombers like that and then you know, they have a stack of bombers, either it's at Guam or it's somewhere in the United States, and you just see B-52 after B-52 after B-52 after B-52, and then they fly them over somewhere, you know, and it's a show of force to say, hey, look, we understand what you're doing, we're not happy about it, and here's our response, and we're just warning you that we know what you're doing, and we're not happy about it, and we really don't want this to go any further, so please stop what you're doing. <laughs> And so that, those are some of the strategic um, cards that are played uh, to deter, because that's what it's all about, right, is deterrence. Okay, so we want to deter our adversaries from conducting cert certain actions, right? You know, we would have liked to have deterred the Chinese from building all these artificial islands in the South China Sea and then militarizing them, but we failed. Why did we fail? Because we were so focused on the counter-ISIS, counter-Al-Qaeda fight that it just wasn't visible and if it was visible no one cared about it so there's all these strategic choices that have to be made but the the, the bottom line is that we are always looking to deter people from p not people we're, <clears throat> we're looking to deter nations and their governments from from disrupting the the strategic environment in a way that's not beneficial to us looking at dod specifically mm -hmm. what are you know you know what what from your perspective what are some of those things that dod can do to match that some of those emerging threats. I know the debt's a little bit of a separate subject, but right. <clears throat> well, I mean, you have to take a look at what um, let's talk about the army specifically, right? You know, the Chinese army um, traditionally has not been an expeditionary army. I mean, the last time the Chinese fought a war was in 1977 against the Vietnamese, and they got their nose bloodied quite badly by the Vietnamese army. I think they lost 40,000 dead and wounded in three months. The so the issue is, is if, if the Chinese are going to build an expeditionary army, then it has to have things around it that are expeditionary. So it has to have that expeditionary aircraft to be able to you know, do airdrops and be air transportable. It has to have the sea lift. And that's what we're seeing out of China. That's, that's exactly what they're doing. So where is that going to be applied? Well, if it's going to be applied in the Pacific, that is a very different fight than what we're used to in the army <clears throat> because you don't have large land masses. And you don't need large tank fleets. What you probably need is a lot of artillery, a lot of air defense, and the ability to actually use precision munitions, which means you have to keep your communications network viable. So it's going to be a much different kind. If we, if we were to go to war with China, which I don't think is very likely for a whole slew of reasons, but if you were going to do it, that's where I think people are focusing at. The senior leadership is focusing in the Pacific. And the nature of the warfare in that region will be much different than, you know, large scale ground combat, such as 3rd Infantry Division attacking into Baghdad during OIF-1. It's not going to be that kind of fight. Obviously, there's a lot of complexities. Can you can you talk a little bit about like the what it looks like when you're when you're talking about a large scale ground combat and developing plans for that uh, in multi domain operations? Well, again, I think the the key is to to understand your enablers, right? <clears throat> the actual fighting force has to be protected. It has to have the logistics tail. I mean, that's one of the, it's one of the things that we've, we learned in SAMS going through is you actually build your scheme of support first 
then you build your scheme of maneuver because if you don't know what your logistics tail is and you don't know how much fuel you, you require or how many you know how many tank rounds that you need um or how many artillery rounds you need if you don't have that in place then it's very difficult to build a scheme of maneuver the complexity of multi-domain operations i think and again I'm a little bit hesitant to talk about it because it's so embryonic. It hasn't really been flushed out. I mean, uh, the Army's only experimented with this stuff for maybe a year or two now, <clears throat> and I don't think we have a real good handle, but we have multi-domain task forces that are standing up in the active component. I think there's one out in the Pacific right now. It's either in Hawaii or Fort Bliss. I don't, don't know where. Um, but they're looking at how do you, how do you create the capability for a, a unit to operate in a contested environment? And what they mean by that is it's going to be contested politically. It's going to be contested economically. It's going to be contested with your communication systems. What happens if you don't have any satellites that are working? Um, and so there's, there's really more we don't know now than what we're going to know. Then you have COVID hit and then it delays everything because, you know, we're kind of waiting for this to pass. Yeah, that's what I was kind of uh, kind of curious about was that as you as we dive into everything being more interconnected and it becomes you know, more of a national security enterprise mm -hmm. instead of just DOD focused, like if how that shifts, you know, objectives within the United States military specifically. Well, I mean, <clears throat> we don't know. Yeah, it's a hard question to ask. It's like a blind man walking into a dark room. You just you just don't know what's in the room. Um, you know, you're, you're kind of fumbling around right now, and that's why you have to stand up task forces and experimental units to kind of understand the, the, um, the key, your, your new capabilities, right? You know, they're looking at, you know, there's a, an extended range M777 cannon that they're working on that can shoot out, you know, tens of kilometers further. Um, they're looking at other types of cannon systems. You know, they're looking at direct energy weapons. You know, so there's all sorts of, of different capabilities that are, that are looking to come online that's the science, okay? Yeah. The art is how do we use them? How do we train on them? How do we integrate them? And how do we develop a, a force that can fight under those conditions and, and people are comfortable with it and understand hmm. the, the, the limitations and, and the limitations of the new equipment when it comes online and then also the, uh, the capabilities, you know, what, what makes it different than what we have today. And so we're, just, we're still kind of feeling that out right now. So kind of diving back into your experience then, you know, having looked at a lot of this stuff at the strategic level, what's your advice either um, from lessons learned from getting your hands dirty in this or your advice to National Guard leaders out there who are trying to kind of shape some of their units training and stuff focused to be more towards this large scale ground combat? And Well, I think <clears throat> there, there's a number of things. I mean, the, f the first thing is you have to experiment, okay? <clears throat> And with experimentation is you have to let people fail, okay? And as long as it's not a failure, um, a deliberate failure where somebody's trying to, to mess up on purpose, you have to be tolerant enough to understand that, hey, you're, you're kind of operating in a new environment where we haven't operated for quite a while. So there's gonna be hiccups, right? So that's the first thing, have an acceptance of failure, correct it, move on, get better. The second thing is, um, I think is critical is mentorship. You know, the, the people who, who were like me, who were commissioned in the mid 90s, we were really the tail end of the airland battle. Um, like when I went to my officer basic course at Fort Knox in 1997, we were still doing understanding battlefield calculus and understanding the echelonment of Soviet, for then Russian, but literally Soviet forces and how they echelon their forces. Um, so we're, we're gonna have to get back into that and it's not going to be a very smooth process because we've just lost a lot of that knowledge over time you know as i said the people who were either um, commissioned or joined the joined the army enlisted in the army in the 90s are really probably the last people that that have the the experience so it's, it's going to be a pretty steep learning curve so talking about the national guard specifically here um when we're looking at the you know operational use of you know the national guard forces in large-scale ground combat mm -hmm. can you like obviously a lot longer time for us to spin up than some of the active duty components uh what it you know how does that work when you're looking at national guard utilization in the case of like <clears throat> large-scale war well that's a risk assessment right depends it, it, again it depends so if you have a scenario like in on the korean peninsula where it's literally the the only fight tonight scenario 
Um, there may be things that are required uh, for DOD and the Army to accept to say, hey, look, we have to get National Guard forces into the mix earlier, and we'll assume some risk with not them not being trained up to full standard. Maybe get trained up to the 85% standard instead of the full 100% standard. I'm not saying that's going to happen, just an example. The difference between the Army of today and the Army of the, the late 1980s is that the active Army is only 500,000 people. Right, so we are fully integrated within all the all the plans and all the what's called a tip fid, which is your deployment, you know, orders. So we're going to be used. It's just a matter of how quickly we get there. And then again, outside of the Korea scenario, I think we're going to have a lot more time than we think. I really do. So you had talked earlier a little bit about kind of talking about dime and the mm -hmm. and the national security enterprise as a whole. I was meeting with the with the state department the other day mm -hmm. and they were talking about the state partnership program sure. and how from their like everyone at the state department knew about the state partnership program which mm -hmm. I feel like is is unique because a lot of places you go they don't, you know. Yep. Um you know, how do you, what do you think the role is that from, you know, as a strategist perspective, having the state partners across the country, across the world, you know, how does that look? I think it's a great asset, not just for the National Guard, but for the nation as a whole. And the reason why is if you take a look at, you know, great power competition, one, one of the struggles that the U.S. military has had with great power competition is we're not designed for it. Okay, the difference is, is that in, in Russia or China, or Iran or North Korea, any any country that's you that's ruled by an autocrat, there aren't the separations of powers within their government, which means they can use their military in different ways than we can. You know, we're limited by law and by policy on what how you can utilize the military. State partnership program, I think, is an, an invaluable tool <clears throat> for great power competition because it develops alliances, it develops um, training opportunities, you know, professionally military professional military education opportunities. Um, and I'll give you a perfect example. So when I was in deployed Afghanistan the last time, the Poles and the Illinois National Guard have a very close state partnership uh, program relationship. How does that relate into, you know, battlefield power? Well, the Poles deployed a brigade of, of infantry called Task Force White Eagle every year. And they had anywhere between 30 and 50 Illinois Guardsmen that were um, advisors within the Polish brigade. So why does that matter? It matters because that's one less American brigade that can be used in a fight. Yeah, we sent some people over, but it's really, um, it's, it, it's multiplying our battlefield combat power by forming these alliances. And that's just with a, a combat focus. <clears throat> if you go back into the great, com great power competition sphere is, you know, the friendships and the relationships that are made, uh, there's a sense of mutual, you know, shared, uh, shared understanding their shared, um, there's a shared sense of, of who, who the adversary is. There's a shared sense of hardship. And so that develops over time and, and becomes very, very critical as, as, as we know more people uh, within other nations' militaries who rise up in, in power and stature within their military, it allows us access that we normally wouldn't have, okay? So I think it's a, it's a superb uh, vehicle for the National Guard, and, and I'm not surprised that the State Department thinks highly of it. I mean, if you talk to most people within DOD or the State Department or the interagency, they, they see the value in it. They really do. Kind of shifting gears back again. We're, if we're talking to that, that first-line leader mm -hmm. on the officer side, like whether that's your platoon leader your, mm -hmm. or your, even your platoon sergeant, right, or your company commander, first sergeant, like those people that are working at that tactical level, mm -hmm. what is your advice to them for preparing for, like, modernization, some of those big changes that are occurring within our formations? So um, no, a number of things, really. I mean, number one is mentorship. You know, uh, if you're a leader, you have to be a mentor. Well, you can't be a good leader and a good mentor if you're not mentored yourself. So finding a good mentor, um, and, and by the way, good mentors should be hard on you. You know, they should be telling you what your limitations and things that you need to be better at. You know, it's not just a, a happy to glad, hey, you're the best thing since canned beer. It just doesn't work that way. It's, as a mentor, I have to point out to people who I mentor is, hey, look, here are the things you're strong at. Here are the things you need to work on. Here's, here's how you do that, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is is um, just read, 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 and when you're done reading, read some more, because 
you, you absolutely positively have to have an understanding of military history, of doctrine, of tactics. And if you don't have that, um, you really don't know your job. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it comes down to. So the more you read about that sort of thing, the better educated you become, the more valuable you are to your chain of command. You have to keep flexibility of thought. Do not become dogmatic. You know, when new information arises and, and the environment is changing, you know, you have to adapt with the environment, mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you take those three things, um, I think that will set you, those will set you up for success when you come out of the tactical and the company grade level uh, world and into the field grade and operational strategic level. It's a solid foundation. So, and you talked a little bit about reading there, just mm -hmm. kind of tying up. We, we always ask some of these same questions to all of our guests, and that is like, you know, what are some of the resources that really helped develop you as a leader over the course of your career? Having great mentors, you know, um, people who were willing to challenge me. Um, there were two or three that saw something in me that I didn't know I had and would push me to to, to get to, to where I'm at, um, whether that is a, <clears throat> was at a, at a uh, company grade level or a field grade level or as a lieutenant colonel. Um, actually, my boss right now, she mentors the heck out of me every day, uh, whether I want it or not. So it's, um, that, that's really important. Um, but I just go back to reading. I really do. I mean, read your history. You know, if, if I think a lot of people get confused about multi-domain operations, well, they just broke, o broke open the 100-5 1986 version and looked at air land battle and looked at what we have in writing on multi-domain operations, there wouldn't be that much of a difference, but we don't read history and that's, that's part of our problem. I've got four books that I would recommend. Um, the first book is called A History of Western Military Thought by an Israeli historian called Azar Gat, G-A-T. And <clears throat> One bright officer who I mentor said that uh, this was CGSC in one book, Command and General Staff College in one book. And what it does is it looks at it looks at how the philosophical um, underleanings of the Enlightenment all the way up to the current day influenced military thought, influenced tactics, influenced um, the way that we conduct warfare in the West. Okay, so that, that's invaluable. The second book, and this dovetails nicely into that, is called The Scientific Way of Warfare by a uh, French Canadian called Antoine Bousquet. And that looks at the industrial revolutions over time and how that's influenced uh, warfare. So if you put those two together, you have a rock solid foundation and you will know more than 90% of the officers in the army because 90% of the officers haven't read those two books. Um, the third book I would recommend is um, The Transformation of War by Martin Van Creffeld, another Israeli uh, historian. And <clears throat> he wrote that in the early 90s and what he said was, and I think it became very true on 9-11, was that, look, people fight for a whole lot of different reasons. They just don't fight for their country. They fight for their tribe. They fight for their religion. So what he calls it is non-Trinitarian warfare. What he's referring to is Clausewitz's trinity of the army, the people, and the state. Mm -hmm. It's outside of that. So that, that's why it's really important, because we spent the last 20 years fighting non-Trinitarian warfare opponents, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, those sorts of... Um, terrorist groups. And then finally, I think um, a book that is very interesting, it is, it will probably make you angry when you read it, but that's part of being an intellectual is to read things that you may not agree with, is, is a book called The 50-Year Wound. Uh, it's written by a guy named Derek Liebart, who's a professor at Georgetown. And what this is, uh, what this book is, is an examination of America's Cold War decisions, both militarily and politically, and the cost of those decisions and looking at them and saying, hey, were there better ways we could have gone and done this? And when you look at some of these things and the way that he frames his argument, say, again, you're probably going to be pretty angry. And then you're going to say, hmm, a lot of times this guy was absolutely right. But that's, that's the beauty of reading. It's for the individual to take away the lessons of those books. Mm -hmm. So those, those are the four that I would start with. Colonel Jingleski, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing some of your experiences. If you'd like more information related to anything we discussed here or other features, please click on our social media pages in the links below. Tune into Leaders Recon over the next few weeks as we bring in today's leaders and pioneers to discuss their experiences, share their wisdom, and help you grow as a leader. We will also be announcing opportunities for you to sharpen your skills as a leader in today's Army National Guard. See you next time. 
If you liked today's episode, don't forget to subscribe below and leave us a five-star review. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.